Hello, oh, that's loud. Did you take the clicker with you? Who took it? Okay. What? No, there. See, not right there. Fair enough. Uh, okay, I'm Chris. Uh, I'm yeah, I'm kind of an engineer, uh, and I kind of worked on a lot of stuff. And I'm uh, mostly uh, like that. I actually work on the internet, and that I work in browsers. Um, this is the URL that was supposed to be there where you sign up. It's AKMS Cloud Society for all the cool things that my colleague just talked about. And uh, he's all like, "Yeah, we're going to talk about AI. That's why your talk is going to be about JavaScript." And I'm okay. Why not? So um, I've been working with JavaScript ever since it came out. I started in assembly language, and then I went to Perl because I wanted to write unreadable things. And then I went to PHP, and then I went to JavaScript and stayed there until then. This has been going around for the internet for quite a while, where it's been the, like, there's this joke that this is JavaScript, the definitive guide, and JavaScript, the good parts. And the difference between the books is like this. And it's true, because JavaScript has for a long time not been as a, a standardized language. It's just been something that browsers invented, while the language itself was done in a 10-day uh, sprint. So basically in 10 days, uh, Brandon Eich came up with a language, and he called it JavaScript, because back then Java was cool. And uh, the, the relationship of JavaScript to Java is like, uh, uh, is like ham to hamster, or uh, car to carpet. So there's not much connection between the two, but it's always been a matter of con uh, confusion for people. So what the left book actually was, was a history of what we did with JavaScript and what random things we invented that we never can get rid of. Whereas the right-hand side was just the language, the, the syntax and the grammar of the language itself. I worked with the inventor of JavaScript, and I worked with a person who wrote JavaScript, the good parts as well. So I, I saw both sides, and it's fun to see. But if you want to get happy uh, becoming a JavaScript developer, there's a few things you need to understand. And these are seven things I'm going to go through right now. So the first one is understand that JavaScript is not a language. It is a language, but it's become so much more. Seeing that it has been such a floating, weird thing over the years, like we had JavaScript, ECMAScript is actually the standard language. We had ECMAScript 1, 2, 3, then random stuff happened, then Flash came around, then Microsoft did other things that other companies did, and then we basically lost, uh, lost track and we did random things until in ES5 we finally have now a ratified version of it anymore. But JavaScript is a lot of things nowadays. It's actually far from perfect. Perfect. Anybody who's ever written JavaScript can vouch for that because there's weird things like undefined is not defined or uh, if you do not a number, a type of not a number is a number and all these kind of weird things and rounding errors and all these things. The date object is completely buggered. It's interesting. But JavaScript is also everywhere. It's running in browsers, it's running on hardware, it's running in extensions, it's running on desktop applications with Electron, Slack, if you ever used it, for example, as HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Even Illustrator can be scripted in JavaScript. And AppleScript now is being uh, moved over to JavaScript as well, because AppleScript was just weird. It's free to use, and that's how I actually kind of started with it, because I couldn't afford uh, by buying myself Borland C Builder or finding a pirated copy because that's illegal. So I actually started with JavaScript because I just needed a text editor and a browser. And it's also independent of the environment. So when people say, you need to use a certain browser or a certain environment to start with JavaScript, that's a lie. You can use a text editor, any text editor will do. Uh, even the browsers themselves have developer tools built in now. It's freely documented as well, so you, you can buy courses, you can go to courses, but most of the stuff that's actually up to date in JavaScript is available for free, and that's the kind of stuff that I tweet out about and, and post about a lot. And it's instantly gratifying, and that's how I got into it. I, 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 when I started, I always like, I wrote my code, I pressed a button, say compile, I went for a coffee, I learned another language, I had a quick holiday, and when I came back, I, I saw something on screen, and I realized that there was errors in it. With JavaScript, you basically write the code, immediately in the browser, execute it, find out what's going on. So the, uh, the loop from code to production is much, much shorter. And JavaScript versatility means it needs diverse needs. It's not, like, not everywhere where you apply JavaScript, you apply the same functionality and the same um, design ideas. So 
web scripts are the thing that it started. Like, oh my God, I can make a, a, a trail of, of unicorns go after my mouse, uh, my mouse and these kind of things. I can make a form tell me that something is wrong before I send it back to the server and wait for five minutes for it to render. This was where the great things came back then. But also web view based solutions. Electron, Visual Studio Code is one of them. Uh, Microsoft Teams is one of them. Um, browser extensions. Like, probably all of you that have a browser have some extension running, like Adblock Plus most probably, or some video downloading thing, all the illegal things that we like to do on the internet. <laughs> web-based applications, progressive web apps. If you haven't looked into progressive web apps now, it's the, the cool thing for like two years now. And uh, I, I'm very happy that I worked with people like Starbucks and others to actually take the unwieldy Android or iOS applications and made a URL that I can send to you and you can start buying your coffee. Server-side solutions, Node has been taken over the market for years now, and it's much, much easier than uh, setting up your Apache and being your Apache admin. Convertible to binary formats, WebAssembly, that's a thing that's coming up more and more right now, where we realize that we do far too heavy things in a scripted environment like JavaScript, so we use WebAssembly to turn JavaScript into binary code that can execute directly on the hardware. And of course, powering robots for Notebots. So when I do teaching for children, Making some robots that you can control with JavaScript is much, much cooler than the sending a form off and saying you can't send it off yet because kids nowadays are a bit more spoiled. And of course, we got a package manager, NPM. Most, most of the time when you install JavaScript nowadays, you don't download it and put it in your sites, but you could use the NPM package manager for it. And JavaScript is more now than, much more than we ever expected it to be. We never expected it to be this big thing. It's a standardized language. TC39 is the group that standardizes it. It's an ecosystem, like the whole NPM thing, node environments. It's not just a language anymore. It's a community around that. It's an opportunity to do a lot with one language. There's a lot of damage to be done if you do it wrong. There's a lot of happiness to be found if you do it right. And it's a chance to cause damage in terms of performance and security. Like what runs fast on our, mobile, on our desktop machine is not likely to be good on, a, on an old mobile phone. So take JavaScript with a hint of salt and make, make, uh, optimize it the way you can so your end users don't suffer for it. And of course, if you, uh, if you run a node server, the same security XSS attack vectors apply that with any other server as well. But I think it's time to relax. In a world of that many options, nobody can be an expert in all of them. You don't need to know all of that. It's totally okay if you only like web scripts. It's totally okay if you only work, no, work in Node. It's not okay if you as a Node developer say that people who only write web scripts are not real programmers, because that's bullshit. That makes no sense. Like we, uh, JavaScript is this buffet where you can take what you need and do interesting things with it. So the other thing to be happy as a JavaScript developer is concentrating on the now. If you've been around l as long as I have, you have all these horror stories of browsers like Internet Explorer 6 or Netscape 4, Netscape 3.2 Gold, uh, Opera 5 that still had banners in the browser because it wasn't a free browser. And it makes no sense for you to learn these things. It makes no sense for you to hear these war stories about how terrible it used to be. It makes much more sense to embrace what is now. We have evergreen browsers, we have beautiful environments, we've got development tools that are open and open source that you can use. So if you think about something, uh, when people stop talking to you like, oh, this doesn't work in old browsers, doesn't matter, really. You, people who have to use Internet Explorer 6 are not used to beauty. Don't give them pretty things. They're just confused by that. Just make them suffer the way they're actually happy suffering. And focusing exclusively on the next cool thing is as stifling and depressing. So if you work in the latest canary build or developer tool preview of the browser and you see all these cool experimental features that you would love to have on the web and they will never come to the web, that doesn't make you a happy developer either. Like, the happy medium is in the middle. Like, understanding that there is outdated technology out there and catering for them in the way that you don't give them stuff that they don't need and thinking about the next steps by, putting your, by writing your code for the future, but not relying on experimental technology. 
If you want to know anything about JavaScript, you need to look up right now. The MDN web docs is the place to go. This is not a Mozilla thing. This is basically Mozilla, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Samsung, like everybody who actually does something on the web contributes their content there nowadays. Because we all realized all of us having a JavaScript documentation on our own sites competing with each other is just wasted effort. This is an open wiki, so anybody can contribute as well. So if you're disagreeing with something with there, press the edit button and do something about it instead of whining about it. If you want to know what browsers are doing, there's the caniuse.com as well, which is uh, um, uh, run by somebody in Adobe, I think, yeah. And uh, it, it tells you what browsers can do and it tells you what browsers cannot do as well. And it shows you known issues, it shows you resources that explain how to use these things. So if somebody, uh, if somebody says you cannot use that yet, look at that thing and say like, well, actually you can. There's also note uh, uh, modules for that so in, in your pre-builds to do testing for it or even uh, uh, plugins for different editors that while you're coding it telling you, by the way, this, this won't work in Safari so and so. The third thing is to limit our development environment. And this is, I think, where we waste the most of time. I don't know if it, how it is here, but in America and also in England, uh, it's just amazing how excited we get by how much we can customize the way we develop things as, a, uh, as developers. So that's develop, the web development trinity, as I call it. The first one is the editor. The editor is where we code. This could be Visual Studio Code. This could be Visual Studio. This could be... Um, WebStorm, this could be VI, this could be Vim, this could be Pico, this could be ECMA, whatever you want to use. It's also where we tweak themes. So instead of getting excited that we have all these cool editors, we actually complain to each other on Twitter if the dark theme or the light theme is the better one, or which font is the right one to make the most effective developer. And I'm just getting like, what, that's your issues? Okay, fair enough. This is also where we mix spaces and tabs, like animals, because spaces and tabs are, of course, the biggest worries that we have out there. The second one is the terminal. This is uh, Heathrow, but I'm talking about the command line interface terminal. Um, it's where we do version control. So most of, the, most of our Git workflow is still in the terminal, and most of our uh, uh, creation and like running our build scripts is done in the terminal as well. And that's also where we run build tasks, and that's where we deploy to websites, because we don't go to FTP servers anymore to send a zip up there and unzip it on the server like we used to. That's also where we tweak themes. That's the other thing. Like, of course, you got to use iTerm too, otherwise you're not a professional developer. You've got to use PowerShell because reasons and these kind of things. And that's where we assume everybody runs OS X, and this is, gets, get, this is really annoying me. Because as a JavaScript developer, I was always independent of operating system. And if all your build tools only work on Macs, and Macs are not the most affordable of machines, then I think there is a problem. I've been using Macs for eight years before I joined Microsoft, because now I have to know about Windows again. I jumped from Windows XP to Windows 10. I didn't see anything in between. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> And now we have WSL on Windows, we got all the different Linux distributions on Windows, so it's not an excuse anymore that you need a Mac just to use 1973 terminal technology. That makes no sense to me, but we're very happy about that. And the last one, of course, is the browser. And the browser is where we debug. The developer tooling is amazing nowadays in browsers where you can simulate different environments, you can simulate bad connections, you can actually debug with, with breakpoints rather than like putting alerts and console logs everywhere. And that's also where we check and tweak the visual output. And the great thing is that most browsers are now available headless as well. So you don't even need to run the browser. You can run it in the background, make the browser do a screenshot, and then overlay them and only show you where, where things are different. All these things can be, can be automated, and that's pretty amazing. That's also where we audit, and I'm going to come back to that later. And that's where we, where we annoy end users with the odd log messages. If your final product has console log messages with information in it, you're inviting hackers to go, or go to town on your website. We should not have any console messages other than like jokes or like hiring messages or these kind of things in production because it makes no sense to have developer tools open and see all kind of weird things that are coming there. Because that's where I find out which of your variables is global. That's where I find out where your HTTP requests are going and where I can tweak with them until I get free vouchers for these kind of things. The other day I had an email that said like 20% off and I clicked on it and the email link was basically something like percentage equals 20. 
And I'm okay, let's try 80 and see if it gets cheaper. And 80 didn't work, 79 worked. So I got the $200 t-shirt, a uh, shirt for like $50. It was great. Don't do that. Don't give me information I don't need to know. And this is a lot of duplication and multiplication with choice. So instead of competing with each other on like our final code or doing great things for our end users, we get excited about which color theme to use in, your, in our editors and which is the right editor to do. So tooling is starting to overtake, overtake that historically grown trinity. So having the difference between uh, editor and browser and terminal, having to know all three of these things makes no sense to me. Why? Why should I need to jump between the three things when there is a way to have headless browsers to simulate what browsers are doing in the background anyways? So if you look at uh, good editors nowadays, they consolidate features to avoid context switching. So you don't have to jump from your editor to your terminal to your browser to do the day-to-day -day work. And you don't need to know the ins and outs of all of these things. Well, I don't, know which, I don't care which editor you use as long as it's Visual Studio Code. Mostly because I work on it. And I, 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 there's so many things that Visual Studio Code do, does for you that is great. First of all, Visual Studio Code to Visual Studio is the same as Java to JavaScript. So there's like, yes, they, they got the same name because we thought it's a good name. Fair enough. Um, but it's actually an open source cross platform editor. It's got nothing to do with Windows. It actually runs on my Mac and on my Linux machine as well as it does on my Windows box. It's got hundreds of extensions, whatever you need, somebody will have written an extension and you can write an extension as well if you want to easily. It's highly themable, yes, you can change the colors and the fonts in any way that you want. And it's got built-in built source control support. So if you don't want to know everything about Git and you edit a file and it says like there's a merge conflict there, click on the thing, type in what the difference was, send it off in the background at Visual Studio Code, does the Git stuff for you. So when I teach Git or when I teach development, I start with that one and then I go to the power moves into the terminal. Because, again, if you know too much about the terminal without knowing what it does, you can create a lot of chaos. It's got a built-in terminal as well. And you can switch between the terminals. You can switch between PowerShell. Uh, uh, in my case, I use Ubuntu. And sometimes I use Kali Linux because it's fun. And it integrates into build process as well. So instead of going to your terminal and write your NPM build or whatever, it's like basically you save the file, the build process runs in the background, and you can keep coding while it's actually trying it out for you and giving you the log messages back when there's something wrong. It also is written and extensible in TypeScript. So I love that I can mess with my editor in the language that it's written in. So basically, before that, I used HomeSite. HomeSite was JScript, which was JavaScript's red-headed stepchild by Microsoft. Uh, and you could extend the, the editor with JavaScript. Now, like, this is pretty cool, but nowadays, TypeScript is the thing to do. Easy. It straightens and lightens your teeth with repeat use. So actually, you get better teeth by using Visual Studio Code for a long time. And it's possibly good against hair loss as well. So there's really nothing that says you shouldn't be using it. Of course, you got the choice, but why would you? I love this, this tweet by Chris Anderson where he says like the autocomplete is amazing. So you just put like RQ STL OT and it says request options out of it. So I can actually roll my forehead on the on the keyboard and it writes some code for me kind of thing. And it's it's true. The first time I used it, I felt it annoying that it does all this auto-completion for me. But I realized I become a much more efficient uh, developer by not having to know these things by heart, but just typing three things and it does the auto-completion for me. I find methods and properties of objects and of libraries that I didn't know about with the auto-completion as well. And you can turn the whole thing off if you don't like it. That's fine too. So one thing it does also is like does all the breakpoint uh, debugging for you. So this is now Node. You can run a Node process in the background and uh, in the terminal that's built in, you just run your Node process and instead of having to go to the terminal and run it there, it finds a problem, goes to the breakpoint, gives you all the inspection of the Node process running in the background. And that could also be another process. This could be a browser process. This could be anything that gives you back information with the debugging protocol because that's built inside the editor. You never have to leave the editor anymore, except for tweeting and looking at cat pictures in your browser. 
If you want to know more about it, uh, my colleague Berg Holland has this great uh, VS Visual Studio can do that, VS Code can do that.com, which is like new videos every week or so showing what Visual Studio can do. And there's also a new build of Visual Studio every month, which is just intense what's coming in there. So instead of using your own machine, why not try online before? That's another thing. Like we love getting very excited about how to set up our development environment and then the laptop breaks and we have to start again from scratch. So when I, when I try to explain JavaScript to other people or when you want to report a bug to me, use some of those online tools that we have, like jsbin.com or codepen.io or glitch.com. These things allow you to actually play with all kind of preprocessors and, uh, and linters and setups without having to go in through the pain of setting up all the things on your machine. Because every time there's something new coming out, I set it up on my machine and then like two weeks later somebody says, like, don't use that. And I'm like, well, it's not on my machine now, so what do I do? I get the thing slower again, might be a security problem in the future. Don't have to install all of that on your own machines if you can just do it in one of those. And it's so much better to collaboratively edit things online than to send each other emails trying to explain each other what our code is doing. Uh, Visual Studio also has a live sharing now, so you can actually share the code with, uh, with other people and write on the same document, much like Google Docs, you can share with other people and work at the same time. So that's also really cool for job interviews, for example, or for, uh, for hackathons where people are like, I'm stuck and I'm like, well, do a live share, I come into your editor and I fix it with you, rather than you trying to explain to me what's going wrong. It's important that we make it harder to write bad code. And this is again where the, the flexibility of our tooling nowadays comes in. I love that when I use Word or any other text editor for that matter, I get these squiggly lines when I write something wrong because I want to know when I'm wrong rather than like looking stupid when it gets out to other people. And this is happening the same way in editors nowadays by uh, applying a stricter rule set to things. So this is basically a JavaScript, uh, a little JavaScript file. By just putting a comment on top of it, um, if it works, yeah. By just putting a comment on, of, on top of it, saying TS check, you turn on the linter of, uh, of TypeScript. And that one, the editor tells you what's going wrong with your code. So every time there's a squiggly line, it tells you you need to do something. So this variable was not defined, these kind of things. And then out of a sudden, you don't have any squiggly lines anymore and your code is much cleaner. Same for CSS, same for Markdown, same for HTML. There's linters for all of these things. And I love that I don't have to go through the process of writing code, executing it, getting an error, learning the debugging environment, and going back to my code. While I'm writing it, I'm learning about best practices and I'm learning about what I can do better. So linting to me is kind of better than debugging because you find mistakes while you make them, you, it's based on the experience and consensus of many others. So sometimes you're like, why is this an error? And linters explain kind of why it's an error and why you shouldn't be doing it. You can learn from explanations of the linting results rather than having to go to documentation and read it up yourself. You can install and configure or use the built-in linting. Of course, for your project, you might want to have another linting rule than the inbuilt one. And uh, that's basically it. To me, it's from moving from knowing everything to learning by making mistakes. And as I said before, JavaScript became so big, our development environment became so big, you cannot know everything anymore. I think the whole I'm a full stack developer is a nice thing to say. It's a terrible thing for companies to demand because I cannot expect somebody to know from setting up a server and protecting it against all kinds of attacks to tweaking CSS and making sure it actually works in every mobile platform. Nobody can know all of this. You should be allowed to become an expert in one of these bits, but you should still feel, uh, feel understanding for the other parts. So there's a lot of arrogance right now going between like, CSS is not a real language, JavaScript people are all evil. This, is, this makes no sense to me. We're all working on the same thing together and it's different skill sets building good products. Adding custom linting and validation to your development and release process is another interesting one. This is WebHint. Uh, WebHint is another project that I worked on and I'm still working on. It's, it's, a, it's by the Open Foundation now. It's basically Microsoft engineers, but there's a few people from Samsung in there as well. And of course, we like contributions, but it's donated to the, um, we donated it to the Open Foundation because we didn't want it to be only a Microsoft product. 
Uh, what it does, it's like there's a, there's a URL, a, a, a Webhint.io, you can enter a URL, and it does a test on your product in terms of accessibility, compatibility, PWA readiness, performance, pitfalls, and security problems. So these, you get like messages, what's going wrong with your product. But this is not only a website like, uh, like other linting tools online, but it's also an NPM package. So you can install this in your process, and every time you build something, it does these tests, and it tells you like, well, you should fix that security hole before you actually go live, which is a good thing to do. There's also a Visual Studio Code extension that you can put in the browser, in the editor itself, so it tells you why you're doing something wrong. So getting to know your tooling is something that I think is important because tooling helps us. I was always still like, oh, you should only use a text editor in the browser, you shouldn't use tools. But we're much better nowadays by having a complex environment for tooling, like build scripts, linting tools, deployment scripts, all these packaging managers that we do. I think it's, there's no way around them anymore if you want to be a JavaScript developer nowadays. Because knowing them gives you superpowers and insights how to build great solutions. These, these powerful messages of like finding security problems before you send them out is only possible when you follow a strict rule of like how to build your things rather than like randomly live code on the server. If you don't want anything to do, please do me one favor and stop using console log for everything and use breakpoints instead, because it will make you happier. First of all, there will not be a stray console log anymore in live sites out there. And secondly, with a, with a breakpoint or a watch point as we have now as well, you get the whole context. You not only get that one thing that you wanted to look up, but you can also look up further up the, up the chain and down the chain how what you did interacted with other things. So instead of having to write 15 console logs to read out different things, you have to put one breakpoint in there and then use the breakpoints in Visual Studio Code, in browser development tools, or in other editors that you want. It really is the step that made me a better developer from just being somebody who writes JavaScript randomly. If you like what you see and you, you're, you're actually becoming, uh, you feel empowered by using other people's NPM packages, by using other people's libraries, I think it's just fair to give back. And I've been giving back my whole career, and that's basically made my career. I became kind of famous by giving out stuff for free and contributing to other people's free stuff. And that is good, because if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, which is very likely how people drive around here, my code survives, because <laughs> somebody else can maintain it. So help, even if you don't know coding, if you don't want to do coding, help document stuff. Documentation is incredibly uh, useful, incredibly powerful, but most developers are really bad at it because we assume everybody's as intelligent as we are. Help clean up and send pull requests, just sometimes a typo, sometimes a non-initialized uh, uh, variable is a very powerful thing to do. Publish your own work as open source, enjoy meetings and events, like right now. Use this, talk to each other, be nice to each other, empower each other, don't try to show off to each other in this. Well, you can shoot at each other at the laser tag tonight, but don't shoot at each other during the breaks. That's not a good thing to do, verbally, I mean. Help by example, not by telling people what they should do. Help them, instead of like, you sh you're doing this wrong. Yet, let them find out how they're doing it wrong themselves. The last thing is to muffle the noise. Not everybody needs to, load, no, to love JavaScript, and not everybody needs to know the nuts and bolts of JavaScript. So, <sighs> telling people that they should know about everything makes no sense either. It's easy to get tempted to sell people your experience as a best practice, but a best practice to me is being found. Every project has different best practices, every environment has different best practices, every way how people learn is a best practice. So there's not one, one best practice to rule them all. So let's talk about this a bit. Find the largest item in an array, one of those stupid questions you would find in an interview. This is the, the array, and then the first thing I would do is like an old JavaScript person would do something like this, a for loop over it, doing a temporary uh, uh, variable and giving the biggest one always to become the temporary variable. Fine. Then you learned that Internet Explorer 6 has a problem with for loops because it doesn't perform well, so instead of using a for loop forward, you use a while loop backward, which already makes it a bit less readable for the non-initiated, but it actually executes faster, so you're doing something for the machine rather than for the human. 
Then you actually start reading up and you find out there is a math max thing, so you don't need to use that if statement uh, doing the comparison of the two numbers. That's already built into JavaScript. Who knew? I started writing doc reading documentation. Out of a sudden, it's in there. And then you can actually do, the, uh, do a clever thing. You just look at the, uh, at the uh, uh, methods of the array object itself, and you realize there's a sort reverse zero. That's a very dirty way, but fast way to actually find the lowest number of that, because you turn them into strings, and then you, uh, it's really bizarre. And then, of course, you can go with all cool new notation and write a lot less code and make it confusing for people who learned JavaScript 20 years ago. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's not a good thing. So which one is the best? The answer is it depends. Because who is writing the code? Are you actually state-of-the-art node developer so you can go with the latest ES6, ES 2019 things? Are you, are you somebody who is like working in an IBM-based old company that will not change their things in the next 30 years? Where does it run? Which browsers have to be supported? How clean is the data we deal with? I mean, the sorting sometimes here assumed that all of the entrances are integers and not some string in between. How horrible old, which horrible old environment needs support? Who will maintain it? How likely is it ever to change? And how will it be used? These are all things we have to ask ourselves before we say, this is the right way to code this. Because we're people. We're, we're working with different weird environments at times. So validating and triaging to me is something that's more of a skill than telling, like, knowing all the cool things. Let's not feel bad, not everything in the JS world excites us. So if you don't care about Node, you're not falling behind. You're not unnecessary for the market. You can still cool st do cool stuff in the browser. Not everything hot and cool is ready to replace what we're comfortable with. So if you don't want to use the, the spread operator because you don't understand it, you don't need to use it. If it doesn't make our lives easier, it's okay not to use it. Hype moves fast and forgets fast. A lot of times you're like, oh my god, you should use this. And then I don't find time to try it out. And two days later, you should never have used this. And I'm like, well, good thing I didn't spend any time on that. And let's get excited, but also ready to give it a meh, meh, fine, doesn't matter to me. Don't have to be part of that massive online conversation. Projecting isn't good. What makes us effective can be very subjective. I like Visual Studio Code. You might be happy in Dreamweaver. Fine. I'm not one to argue. It makes sense to talk about our success. Instead of telling people you should use this, tell them I used this and this is how faster I was building this cool thing. It makes less sense trying to force others to do the same and new approaches lead to new happy paths. Let's not discourage people from finding theirs. So when I tell people that doesn't work, it didn't work in 1997, it will not work now, I'm not helping you. I'm actually stopping you from being creative. So let's not kid about ourselves about the bleeding edge. The amazing new idea today might become the problem of tomorrow. jQuery not being updated in lots of websites slows down the mobile web right now. Production code moves less fast than we think. Like we, In production, you're not as creative as you can be in your own blog. Our end users aren't guinea pigs or canaries. They actually are there to do a job, and you, we should be protecting them from mistakes. And it's bleeding edge. Make sure you have enough blood to give. Because it's a lot of effort to be on the bleeding edge all the time. So let's make this a great community. Let's be the people we'd like to have met when we started. Instead of being like another angry JavaScript person that tells everybody off for doing the wrong things. Let's be kind. Let's be supportive. Let's allow people to learn by making mistakes and letting off steam. So sometimes they, they say something stupid. Let them do it. Let them try it out. And then tell like, well, how did that make you feel now? Let's not get lost in pointless drama. And I think more or less, like, let's have fun with what we're having right now. So going into the next, at the end of the conference, I'm out of time, so I'm actually doing this as a quick wrap up now. If you haven't done yet, we just released Microsoft Edge as a, uh, a new browser available uh, on, on these, these development channels. And it's the first time in the whole history of JavaScript that every single day we have a new browser build. And this is friggin' cool because that's what I wanted when I started. My job interview is like, Chris, what do you want to do here? And I said, kill Internet Explorer. <laughs> and with this, we can. 
If you like machine learning, and you're going to hear more about this right now, there's a W3C group, discussion group right now, about doing machine learning on device in JavaScript. So you don't need to learn Python, you don't need to use any uh, AWS or Google or Azure things. You can actually do it in the browser. So that's an interesting discussion that's happening right now. And I think we should use JavaScript and machine learning to help the human. I love this demo by Charlie. She's a developer in Australia. And what she did is she used TensorFlow to actually teach a computer to realize that she's moving her head to the left or the right, or to not to up and down and back. And she uses that then to actually give you a, a keyboard for people who cannot do anything but move their head. That's all in JavaScript using TensorFlow inside the browser. I mean, in th that's amazing. Back in the days, this was impossible to do without a grand and like three months of development. And of course, don't forget to have fun. This is another great demo by Cassie, where she uses facial detection, like machine learning facial detection, to have this little guy dancing here. So he's dancing, and as soon as you look at him, he's actually shy and stops dancing. <laughs> and that's another demo on code pen to play with, and I love when people get creative like that. And that's all I had, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christian. What an awesome presentation. Thank you. Really great to have you. Let's keep you here for two minutes. Uh, we might have an opportunity for questions, if you don't mind. Yeah? Cool. So uh, if, while the mics are going around, I know we have a question here. But uh, while the mic gets to you, you know, tell us a little bit about getting into Microsoft, such a huge company, trying to do something. As you said, like when you started, you wanted to do something with Internet Explorer and really change things. How is that dynamic of trying to really change stuff from inside such a large organization? It's tough at times. Uh, I think networking in the company is one of the biggest things. I was very happy when my manager uh, hired me and he said, like, the first half year, I want you to go around the company and pester everybody and get to know everybody. I want you to actually be able to have somebody in each department to talk to to, uh, to, get, to, uh, to to get something done. I was lucky because I came already with a good pedigree. I came already with, like, okay, Chris is there for, for doing communication skills and making people work with each other. But in general, I think, uh, I think just being open and realizing that everybody in the company is a person, no matter how high up. Is a very uh, is a very powerful thing to do, and let your uh, let your, uh, your let your products uh, uh, speak for yourself. Like helping other departments and helping different parts of the company work with each other is a very very important step. My main step in any other company and also in Microsoft to a degree is to get to know the people at reception at the office because mm. they know everybody. Right. It's the fastest way to get somebody something done and to get a meeting room organized instead of like having to go through the official channels. So being a human and talking to other people is, I think, very important. Also, asking questions, asking questions to every one of your colleagues, like, what if, why have you done it like this? What's the benefit kind of thing? Encouraging uh, communication is a super uh, important thing. I was very lucky as well that uh, with Satya, we have a CEO who wants change and basically wants to, to do things differently than before because uh, sometimes you just run against the wall and there's just nothing you can do. And if that happens, it's, uh, it's, it's a sad thing. And of course, mm. other, other companies are hiring. Great advice. So we have a question from uh, Faisal. <laughs> hey, Chris. You uh, stand up, uh, Faisal, and perhaps introduce yourself as well. Uh, yeah, Faisal. Uh, can we have the mic, please? Is the mic on? OK, all right. My name is Faisal. I'm with Expedia. Um, uh, thank you for a fantastic uh, presentation, by the way. Uh, I really love it. I really see how uh, JavaScript is going everywhere. My question to you is about the convergence of our of user experiences into the mobile uh, space. Uh, how do you think JavaScript will play there because of the performance issues? Um, you know, uh, the latest SunSpider benchmarks put mobiles and tablets way below desktop performance. And considering that ARM is nowhere near Intel and, you know, within the foreseeable future, they're not going anywhere close there. How do you think JavaScript will be able to compare in that space uh, against native apps? I think the, the, the question was about, like, JavaScript performance on mobile compared to native environments. Native will always be faster. The same as, like, assembly language will always be the fastest, but also incomprehensible and hard to maintain. So, um, JavaScript has come a long way since we started on mobile with like Firefox OS when I worked on that back then. So the, the margin between the speed of like native code towards uh, what JavaScript code does on, uh, does on mobile is not as big as we think it anymore, especially when we consider the use cases. So instead of trying to beat an Apple iOS app with uh, touch 
touch type, whatever, like force touch and these kind of things and trying to do the newest, coolest things in our product, let's think about what people use our products for and optimize for that. And the great thing about when we think about mobile first, when we think about a Moto G4 as like the mid-level range of the market phone to try our things on, if we make it run well on that one, it will be blazing fast on, on new iPhones and new Android devices as well. So considering that our end users are most likely four or five generations behind what we consider the current way of using things, it's actually in more interesting to optimize for those environments than for the newer environments. If it comes to like hardcore gaming, these kind of things, that's where WebAssembly comes in. WebAssembly can actually allow you to write JavaScript and convert it into native code, much like uh, Cordova, Apache Cordova or other things did before. So now we have a standardized way of doing that to a degree as well. I don't think that we actually have quite understood what people use on mobile. And uh, we haven't looked over the shoulders of our end users what they really want. We just throw things at them and hope they love them. And this is not the way to actually consider performance and these kind of things. JavaScript has come a long way in terms of performance. Of course, you can do terrible things in your JavaScript code, so be up to date of what is slow and what is, what is convenient. So um, it, it's a matter of like optimizing for that, but I don't think we're that far off any longer. And I also think that the market of like downloading a native app for everything that I want to do, I've got about 20 different mobile apps for different, uh, for different uh, airlines on my mobile phone. That makes no freaking sense. That's where PWA comes in. Pre Progressive Web Apps actually gives you the app features, but only when you need them. And up front, it's just a fast loading website that allows you to check in for your flight and then the other features you can get later on. So that's the, the, where the web and native apps come together. So Progressive Web Apps is the answer to that problem as well. Fantastic. Hmm? Or the Expedia app, yeah, of course. All right. Well, thank you so much once again, Christian. Great having you. Big round of applause for Christian. I'll take that from you. Feel free to get some water. I'm sure. I'll be here today and tomorrow, so feel yes. free to talk to me, ask me things. Absolutely. We all want to get to meet you, I'm sure. Oh, God.